Hi, my name is Jed Brophy. You might know me from all the Middle Earth films. Um, I'm, you're, you're listening to me being talked to by Chris Gordon on Ramblings of a Hellraiser, his podcast. And it's one of the best I've ever done this morning. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night, Hellblazers, wherever you may be in the world right now. This is Chris Gordon on Ramblings of a Hellblazer, and not just Hellblazers, listeners forum, wherever you may be. This is absolutely fantastic. Thank you very much for tuning in and listening to me. So, tonight I bring to you a fantastic interview with um, a gentleman who everybody knows and loves as Nori the Dwarf from The Hobbit. He has also been in many other things. So tonight, my friends, I bring to you Jed Brophy. Okay, so welcome everyone. Um, Today I have the absolute pleasure of bringing Jed Brophy here, who played Nori in The Hobbit. So, Jed, Indeed. how are you? <laughs> I'm very good, thank you. Good morning. Good. Well, yeah. it's morning here. I know, it's, I'm, I feel like the Doctor Who, you know, I'm, I'm time travel. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> talking I'm, to I'm tomorrow the only people. Doctor Who. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, talking to the tomorrow people, Gordon. Yeah. <laughs> it's 8 o'clock in the <laughs> evening for me and it's 9 o'clock in the morning for you. That's just on the following day. That's just. <laughs> I'm used to it's talking. Magic. It's the magic country we live in. <laughs> yeah, definitely, yeah. Yeah, the. Uh, the good old Middle Earth. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Indeed. Cool. So, yeah, as you know, I've uh, asked a few people for questions, and I've got a few questions of my own, just standard ones, to sort of get us talking and get to hear some stories that uh, I'm sure you'll relish in. <laughs> Gagging to tell you. <laughs> cool. Awesome. Okay, so I'll start off with, what role would you aspire to be in film, TV, or theatre? To, to be role. completely honest with you, if I was to go back in time, I'd play Aragorn. As a young man, that's what I, that's who I aspired to be was Aragorn. I think he's cool. the best, he's the best hero in anything I've ever seen. Yeah. But apart from that, probably a, a kind of a, a lawman who's, you know, back in the Wild West, a lawman cleaning up the town. I think that would be quite a cool, quite a cool part to play too. I grew up watching Westerns, so yeah. um, <laughs> that's kind of my favourite genre, even though it's not everyone's favourite genre. For me, the Western is kind of, that's the epitome of filmmaking. Oh, fair enough. Good old Clint Eastwood, <laughs> John yeah, Wayne. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah so I was brought up on spaghetti westerns. My dad loved them. Um, so yeah, all the Outlaw, Josie Wales, and Good, the Bad, yeah. the Ugly, all of them. Yeah, so I can totally relate to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's something about um, what you like, Shane, one man alone, mm-hmm. putting himself in the harm's way, and I think that's why we all love The Hobbit so much because yeah. it's one person outside the comfort zone, kind of saving humanity. Mm. It's a great way to put it, <laughs> and it's true. Yeah. All down to some, yeah, totally, yeah, someone totally unknown, totally thrown into yeah. a situation. Yeah, someone who's not, who shouldn't be heroic, really, who's actually put themselves in harm's way. It's that thing of sacrificing uh, yourself for the good of, you know, others, and, and I think yeah. that's, I think that's why Tolkien stories for me are so resonant. Mm-hmm. Well, it's just nice. It shows the uh, the better side of humanity, doesn't it? That you know, that's what. Humanity aspires to do is for the humble yeah. to put themselves forward, and uh... yeah. I think we all hope that, given that situation, we would do the same thing. You yeah. know, I think that's one of the it's one of the remarkable things. It's why so many people love those stories, as they go, "Yeah, I'd do that." Totally. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> In reality, no. No, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly yeah. <laughs> would you walk up to the mountain and throw stones? No, you wouldn't. <laughs> no. <laughs> this was a cable car running. <laughs> oh yeah, true. exactly. Yeah, or would you actually feel so welcoming when you come home to find a house full of dwarfs have taken over and basically wrecking your house? <laughs> yeah, they've done that on occasion. Graham McTavish, especially. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> cool. So, what's the most difficult scene across? I mean, obviously you've been in a lot of work. So, what's the most difficult kind of scene across all your work that you've ever had to film? These are just generic. I think probably the, the day that we did on the wet set with the Stone Giants, um, mainly because our costumes gained about 20 Ks. We were all incredibly tired and mm-hmm. sore at the end of that day. Just It was just, um, we, we'd been filming for quite a long time in the Hobbit up to that point, and I think our bodies were quite tired, and that, that was kind of the, almost the straw that broke the camel's back. Um, right. Scene 88 had come and gone. We'd been sprinting all over New Zealand, and the wet set, <laughs> Graham McTavish actually weighed his costume and it was 28 Ks. But that was with the fat suit that had absorbed all this water. The costume Uh had absorbed all the rain. And I actually had the, Pete got me to lie down on the scene. I couldn't get back up. 
None of the doors were up. <laughs> they were trying to get themselves back off the ground, and I couldn't get up. They, the camera quickly pans off me because I'm like struggling like a cockroach flipped upside down. <laughs> that, take- that, that was the day that we all. That was the day I heard the most complaints from people, just going, "Oh, this has just got ridiculous." Yeah. Cool. Was there many takes for that then? Which is like, here's the camera coming around day. to see all these little cockroaches coming around. And... It was, yeah, it was all day, and um, yeah, it was just one of those things where it's kind of where it came in the shoot too. It was sort of in the middle of all the hard, hot, and heavy work. Mm. There was a lot of days that were tough, but I have to say personally, I'd do it all again tomorrow. If I got the phone call saying oh, we didn't like any of those films, we're going to reshoot them all, I'd be back there like that, even knowing what it was going to be like. Yeah. I kind of think the hard, yeah, in those kind of films, especially, and in hindsight, more the hard work really shows that it's paid off. Um, yeah. Because it was yeah. just, it was, yeah, it's just an experience I think no one could ever. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, change. we. Sorry, we, I, know, we, <laughs> I can't we, make my words out here, that's really bad. <laughs> yeah, we, we know we're lucky, you know. It's, um, you do a lot of other films and you work for other franchises, but there's something about the way that they set this up in terms of the fandom is so. They're unique in terms of the way that they love the writing so much. They love the literature first, and they love um, they love they want to see that we're actually paying you know kudos to it. There's a lot of responsibility, but at the same time, that actually that's a good thing. You, you you kind of feel like you want to do a good job, and you want to make sure that people enjoy it. So yeah, yeah, awesome. The pa- yeah, it's definitely a passion that you guys seem to have for it, and it's a. Uh... Yeah, it, 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 yeah. The, the the fan base across the world just proves how much of a good job you guys have done. <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's a kind of a two edged thing, you know. If the fan base wasn't there, the, you you wouldn't feel the responsibility. But um, you know, it's uh, they keep us honest. It's a good thing. <laughs> Excellent. Now, just one of the from the general one before we move on to all your Hobbit related ones is obviously you're no stranger to cult classics, having been in Hercules and also Ramius in Xena. Do people still there uh, come to you for those two? Because they've got huge, they, fan, especially Zeno has got a massive fan base. Yeah, as well, so. they they had the last really big convention in the US last year, and so a lot of friends of mine went. I was actually, I think, I was working on something. Right. But yeah, that that fan base, that fan base has been great. But the one thing it did for the New Zealand industry is it upskilled us. It was the first time that Hollywood had come here and shot a big TV series in New Zealand, and mm-hmm. a lot of our crew, a lot of our stunt crew, um, a lot of our actors got an opportunity that they hadn't had before. To sort of work on a on a something that had a, a much larger audience than the New Zealand audience, right? And in a way, and Weta worked on that too. They worked on the big creatures and a lot of the armor and the swords. And in a way, it was what prepared us for being able to do Lord of the Rings. Without Xena and Hercules, we would have been really be behind the eight ball coming in to shoot that. But mm-hmm. because our crews had worked on something that had such a large scale to it and such big stories, and was quite big theatre was quite theatrical in the way that it was shot. We were ready to do something with swords and sandals again. (laughs) And so when the Lords of the Rings came along, we were like, wow, lucky we had all that prep work on Xena and Hercules. Nice one. (laughs) It kind of, yeah, did help as well. So Lord of the Rings must have (laughs) just, uh, for the economy for New Zealand as well, it's just absolutely, it must have been brilliant for you. Um, And the scenery, you really have got the scenery. New Zealand is Middle Earth. It's just, you couldn't picture anywhere else. Um, It's just beautiful. No, it was... We're, we've spoiled it for everyone now, having the beautiful scenery. Uh, we didn't mean to; it just was here. You know. We had no choice but to use it. Yeah, we've got Snowdonia went there right by where I am in North Wales, which obviously oh, we wow. were close to last time. But it's, yeah. it's not got a patch. It's beautiful, and there's parts of it which so are really beautiful. But it's it's, yeah. it's not a patch on the, on New Zealand. So I'm highly envious. On, on, its, on its own, it would fit in if we could grab Snowdonia and put it in. It would fit in very well with everything else we have. Oh, it would do, yeah, but you're not stealing that from us. <laughs> we'll see, we'll see, mate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think Pete could probably afford it, actually. Yeah, he probably could. But it's probably made that much on it. Yeah. Shh, don't tell anyone. Shh. <laughs> awesome. Cool. So, also, you were in Lord of the Rings as well as just The Hobbit. So, first of all, Sharku, you achieved the war grider. And that was, yeah. a hell of a, that was a monumental scene in itself with Aragorn, Gimli and uh, Legolas. And obviously left a lot of people with their hearts in their mouths, especially me yeah. watching as well. Oh, <laughs> how was it filming that scene and filming it with those three? Especially after you just gone in and said like you know, Aragorn would be your like dream character too. Yeah, so it yeah. originally good. it was meant to be shot at night inside mm-hmm. the stables of um, at Erebus. Um, right. uh, not of um, Erebus of um, what's the Rohan kingdom called? Erebus. It was yeah. supposed to be shot at Erebus, and um, 
Well, it was meant to be shot at night. The horses were all, there's a big fire. Shaku comes in and actually has a fight on the ground with Aragorn. So when we came to shoot it on top of the wag with him getting dragged, we hadn't done any prep work. Right. Pete suddenly realized we hadn't shot it. Um, <laughs> Vigo and I hadn't talked about what we were going to do. And we literally choreographed that fight in five minutes. God. I kid you not. It was snowing. I was in a leather G-string and uh, <laughs> had some leather chaps. It was very cold. Mm-hmm. They had a piece of movable grass that they was like a big reel that they pulled past the barrel right. that I was on to make it look like he was. we were actually moving quite fast. Yeah. And, um he managed to headbutt me so hard it split the prosthetic on my forehead. <laughs> I managed to kick the even star into his uh, into his chest muscle. Went in about four inches. Um, yeah, it was it was shot very very quickly, and I think that first take, the first take of the fight, is the one that's actually in the scene. Is actually yeah. in the film. So it was it was great. I mean, I hadn't I didn't realize up to that point that I'm the only person who kicks Aragorn's butt. <laughs> and um, you know, for all intents and purposes, Shaku thought that he'd won the day that he killed Aragorn. Yeah, and it was really nice to be a part of something that actually did have that effect on the audience. It was great being in the theatre and people going no, <laughs> literally standing on the seats going no, yeah, because they've read the book, so they're going oh no, does he really die? <laughs> 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 yeah, it was great. It was. It was a, that was a fantastic scene. Hearing it, how it's been filmed as well is absolutely amazing. First shot yeah. as a. Pretty awesome. I, I have a feeling now, having seen um, Bolg's character, I think that Shaku may well be Bolg, Bolg's bastard son. <laughs> Looking at the whole, how the whole head is held together by plates, I think that he's inherited his father's good looks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's <laughs> one way to very put it, short, I suppose. <laughs> very short mother orc. A tall father, very short mother orc. Yeah. <laughs> the, yeah, the other thing it that could work. It could work. <laughs> The other thing that was great about that was my first day on set was working with the, the wonderful late Sir Christopher Lee. Oh, um, yeah. Huge admirer of his work up to that point, and mm. that was my first day working at Shaku was with him. Um, my teeth actually came out of my mouth at one point and hit him in the forehead. <laughs> um, and, uh, I was meant to say, the wags have been blooded, my lord. They have tasted human flesh. They are ready to attack. And all I said was, <laughs> And then my teeth came out and oh, hit him no. in the forehead. And without missing a beat, he turned to Peter and said, is it my turn to talk? <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't sure if I was finished or not. So oh, God. Yeah, that, was, that was kind of embarrassing, but also very cool. Awesome. I was going to say, Christopher Lee, I asked Gask working with him. He was, he was someone who I think, I don't think there's a single person who wouldn't admire him as a man no. and as an actor as well. One of the finest, finest out there. So, yeah, I guess it's a true. You know, are you what you've just said? How honoured you are to have actually been in his presence and to work with him. Was yeah. he that? What was he like to work with around on the stage? Was, was he? Did he have that presence was, with him that it was just like everyone just drew to them? Yeah, he did have that presence, but he never played on that. He never. The, the great thing about um, pretty much everyone, in fact, everyone on that film, is no one came with this baggage where they felt like they were any more important than anyone else. Yo. <laughs> Yo, sorry. That's all right. <laughs> um, no one, no one sort of came with any huge ego. Um, he was, he was, he was very aware of the fact that he knew Tolkien himself, and he mm-hmm. would drop that conversation every now and again, going, "Well, I'm not sure he would have done it that way." And, you know, he, <laughs> yeah, no, no, but it was more of a joke. It was great watching him and Ian because they were both two extraordinary actors from the UK who both had very different paths. Um, Ian having come through theatre, whereas mm-hmm. whereas um, Sir Christopher had obviously come through television, but they yeah. knew a lot of people. They they had seen a lot of um, history in terms of um, film history in, mm-hmm. in the UK, and so we felt, we as a, we as a nation felt on a bound to have both of them in the country, to be honest with you. It was, it was an amazing thing. But as I say, he never played on the fact that he'd done more films than anyone in history. He had the Guinness Book of Records, 257 <laughs> films I think he'd done it at that point. Uh, and it's almost unbelievable that someone could be in at that much stuff. But as he said to me, not all of it was good, young man. I was in an awful lot of stuff that wasn't great. <laughs> um, he'd done a lot of Hammer House Horror, which we yep. were big fans of in this country. So it was a huge honour. But he'd also done a lot of prosthetics. And that's what we sort of mainly talked about was how uncomfortable it was to wear what um, what things we used to get through the day. Mm-hmm. Um, he was very interested in how many pieces were put on, what what it was made from, how it was glued on. So it was like a master class, you know, yeah. watching him work. It really was. We, we were 
I mean, uh, yeah, I sort of have to pinch myself sometimes <laughs> to remember, you know, quite what the feeling was working with people like that. It was amazing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. brilliant. It's, it's great to hear her say, because I, I, all the times you ever hear people like yourself talk about him, he would seem to be such a humble man as well. And you're, you're right. Absolutely. I mean, the guy was working until he was 90. He was still, you know, he's in 90, but he's working, still working on films and stuff. And it's just like, man, that's just incredible. <laughs> he, he, he's an inspiration. You know, people say to me, are you going to retire? I'm like, no, I'm going to be like Christopher Lee. Never going to do as many films as him, obviously. But I, I want to still be working and have that much passion. He had so much passion for it. He wanted to get it right. Mm-hmm. I think that was the thing was Peter somehow instilled this great empathy for the craft on set where everyone wanted to turn up and do a good job, but it definitely started at the top. Yeah. If there was any young actor who had come from drama school, had this idea that they were the bee's knees because they were on The Hobbit, mm. working with people like that soon cut them down. <laughs> Their work ethic was amazing. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Fantastic. Yeah. I was saying, even Serene McKellen as well, it's like, you know, as you said, two just greats of the uh, cinematic yeah. theatre world. It's just unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> and again, so very, very humble. Amazing. I see him quite a lot as well. Yeah, he's very, um, very. You see him on the streets. He's always very humble to what to talk to, and you know, it's it's brilliant. I mean, all you guys are, to be honest. You're all like, you know, big heroes to us, and you know, uh, and it's oh. just. <laughs> well, you, thought, you know, I mean, the, the amount of people who said to me, for example, about you, and I'll say this now, just to embarrass you. It's just everyone I've mentioned who I went and talked to, whoever's met you or has heard you and talked to you, gone to comic cons, have just said you are the most, one of the most amiable guys as well. Always with a funny story and everything, and. I saw that at Wales Comic Con. You guys always, you seem to have so much time for everybody. Um, yeah. And as a fan, it's obviously that's that's what is really appreciative. It's like you guys, you know, you're taking an effort to spend time and make to, and sort of get to know everyone who comes to see you. Even yeah. though thousands uh, of people flog through each time, but <laughs> you know, you you take yeah, the time. We we feel a lot of bound to to. Um, it's that thing where we know we're the lucky people. Well, everybody who has anything to do with these books or these films is a fan. You know, I'm a fan myself. If I wasn't yeah. in them, I'd be I'd be going to come at con to listen to those stories. And obviously, yeah. I know that I'm in a privileged position, having been through all six middle earth films. It's it's still quite surreal. You know, it's mm-hmm. a surreal thing to go. Wow, I was part of filmmaking history because I think the way that fantasy is shot and and the way that we view fantasy films now has taken on a whole new light since The Lord of the Rings. It's like they broke new ground. They reinvented the cinematic reel, if you like, in terms of the look of fantasy and the way that fantasy could actually have that kind of impact on Hollywood especially. Oh, yeah, without a doubt. you know, Totally changed. It it was a whole... Yeah, it just brought the whole new level of um, cinematography for people as well. It did, yeah. And, And... Prove that you could make a very complex book that people didn't believe was filmable. You could actually do it. It's, yeah. it's meant that other people have taken on huge challenges in terms of that whole Marvel world. Um, mm. I don't think that those films would have possibly have had the same amount of money poured into them if it hadn't been for the success of things like The Lord of the Rings. You know, the fact that it made money is a, is a huge bonus in terms of getting other people on board to try and shoot something that is complex. And and. Uh, you know, Andrew Lesney, the, the late Andrew Lesney, that can't, we, you can't go past how he changed the look of cinema, mm-hmm. um, just in terms of coloration and shooting at different frame speeds for impact. Um, that, that huge Black Rider chase scene, for instance, I remember sitting and watching the 20 minutes of that cut together and just going, I have never seen anything like that on a film ever. Yeah. It kind of changed the landscape of filming for, yeah. for, for so many people, so... Yeah, it's, uh, we, we know that we're part of something that's bigger than just us, and I think that's why we're generous with our time. <laughs> that's really, it's, it's fair enough. It's lovely to hear the passion in your voice as well, talking about it. And that yeah. you're, you're so you're enthusiastic about it all. You actually played a Black Rider too, didn't you? I did, yeah. I was very lucky. <laughs> I, I, heard, I was at a party for a short film I'd made. And I overheard the, the, um, one of the guys who works for the horse department saying, oh, we're going down to do some Black Rider stuff down the south. And I was like, you, you do know I ride. And he was like, no, everyone rides. And I'm like, no, I, I ride really well. Yeah. And uh, he, he invited me to go out to where they were training the horses and uh, got on a horse and there was a set of jumps there and I put them around the jumps and he went, oh, mate, that horse doesn't jump. And I was like, well, clearly he does because I just jumped all the <laughs> So the next day I was working for the horse department, had um, three months of training before we went down and did those big chase things. It was amazing. 
Oh, fantastic. Yeah. You actually own one. Is it, I've seen a picture on Instagram. So you, is it Asphaloth? Yeah. Or is it, it's, it's Florian is the name of the horse, is it? Uh, uh, Flor, Flor, Florian's owned by a friend of mine named um, Joan right. Abbott. She did all um, Liv Tyler's doubling oh, on right, the okay. film. And, and I think the story goes that Vigo negotiated for her to be able to buy that horse at the end of the end of the show. A lot of people think that Vigo bought the horse. I'm not sure. That's not what he said. But he <laughs> certainly made it aware to the producers that there was that the horse should probably go to the person who did all the great work on it. And I go up and see him up in Otaki every now and again. And mm-hmm. yeah, he, he's still around. He's fathered a lot of amazing horses actually. And, uh, but I own one of the Rohan horses, one of the horses we use for the big charges. Oh, right, okay. I bought him at the end of filming. So yeah, he's, he's my baby. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Keeping it all in the, uh, in the family. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Cool. So in the Hobbit itself, obviously Norrie, Dwarf of Durin's Folk. I won't go into it because everyone knows this more, more than I. <laughs> than, than me, and you've heard it so many times. Um, you've actually answered that one as about whether you're excited to be such a big part of Peter Jackson's The Hobbit, but you obviously are. Um, yeah. And impassioned about that. How did your research play in Norrie? Um, we were very lucky. We, we, um, I'd read the book, obviously, and he only says one thing in the book. He says, Dory lost The Hobbit. I think it's the only <laughs> thing he says. But, um, uh, on the very first day that we all got there, Peter and Fran and Philippa and um, the artist um, John, John Howe and Alan Lee had these amazing drawings of our characters. Mm-hmm. We had all these sketches from uh, Weta Workshop of uh, the different hairdos and the armor yeah. and the, the possible weapons that we'd have. They gave us a complete backstory. Um, right. The Ori Dori Nori story was that um, Ori and Dori had been still part of the family unit, but Nori had been kicked out, possibly for being a thief. Yeah. Possibly for stealing things from his own people. Mm-hmm. Um, whatever his reasons, he'd become a bit of a rogue and he'd been sleeping rough. Um, and this journey was a way of getting to know his family. Yeah. Um, getting to know, especially Ori. Ori hadn't really been a part of the, the whole dwarven, you know, warrior thing. <laughs> so I think Nori was going along there to try and show him a few things about how to be a bit of a ragabond. Yeah. Right. A bit of aroused about. Um, Obviously, Dory is this is this kind of mother hen. So we we'd been given very clearly defined family, um, you know, in terms of the, how we fitted into our families, but also how we fitted into the greater family of, of being part of Durin's folk. You know, we're sort of distant cousins, whereas Philly and Killy and Thorne are obviously directly related. So it was it was really it was a it was a really complex backstory that we were given. So we didn't have to do an awful lot of work on our own. It was really yeah. more taking that and then working out how we were going to incorporate that physically, mentally. We were also given the opportunity of designing our own weapons with a designer from Weta. So oh, right, cool. amazingly, that, that tall Tommy knocker thing that I carry with me was kind of based on a, a Māori taiha, which has a blade on one end and a pointy bit on the other. But to try and make it part of the mythology of Middle Earth, we decided it was a mining tool. Right. So one end is used to break the rock out and the other end is used to break the rock up. Just happens to be very good for smashing goblins and orcs as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, we had we had a lot of input into into making them three dimensional characters from that. Right. Um, okay. As a result, Pete says, "Oh, you know, if it was me, I'd be trying to steal everything that I can find." So every <laughs> set that I went on, I would look to see what I could try and pocket while we were filming. <laughs> but the the, the um, costumers would shake me down in between takes to make sure I could put it all back. But I, I did get some pretty cool things. I was about to ask you, did you want one? <laughs> Come on, can you spill that or not allowed? <laughs> I've I got a lot of pieces of gold. I've got a couple of um, salt and pepper, sh- pepper shakers from the Elven Kingdom. I've got a pipe right. from Bilbo's place, which I which I had to put back. <laughs> but yeah, there was um, that was always Norris thing, was what can I steal that I can possibly use along the way? Because I think he traded with a fair, fair amount of people in Middle Earth. I think he mm. traded um, stolen goods. Possibly with the elves, although he doesn't like them, but he's possibly taken money from them in the past. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, so like I say, we were able to fabricate an awful lot of backstory for ourselves, which was useful in terms of having 13 people on set to find something for you to do. Yeah. You know, if, if, uh, if, if uh, Thorin and Bilbo were having a conversation, the, the background in three-dimensional still has to be real. It's yeah. not like 2D where it's, you know, one in the foregrounds and shot and the background is blurry. We had to still be having a real life, so... Yeah. Having those backstories gave us gave us uh, reasons to actually have conversations with other people on set and and make it a real uh, like a real thing. Awesome, yeah, that's great. It's, it's um, yeah, uh, like it's, 
no, I can't. Just, just, sorry, I've just lost myself again now. <laughs> but just listen, right. listening, listening to you talking away about it, it's just um, absolutely fascinating. But yeah, no, you say when you you have got those background stories as well. That's something that because of the cinematography of Lord of the Rings, you're right. It doesn't just focus on the two central ones. You are you're constantly looking around because there's so much to see. So the yeah. fact that you do, you know, you have evolved yourselves into having those backstories you know it just it it fills out and it just that's what kind of makes it all special it's just it's a constant yeah. constant constant um example of just what just be, works beautifully on screen yeah and it evolved during the, the shoot i remember adam saying there was a point at which he wanted to move away from the family unit and become this dwarf on his own like making his own kind of mm-hmm. Having his own bravery and gravitating more towards Dwalin's character as the war chief, someone to watch to learn how to fight. And, you know, it was really good. So we'd have those conversations on a daily basis where Peter would go, well, here's the set. Um, you work out where you are and what you're doing. And maybe you're hammering away at this thing. He'd give you sort of advice as to how he thought it might work. But he left us as a group of 13 children, basically, yeah. to work out where we were in the play pit. And um, that gave us an awful lot of um, freedom to try and explore those backstories and try and create, a, a, as, as I say, a three-dimensional character for the audience. But it also kept us it kept us alive as characters. You know, if you were just if you didn't have that kind of backstory and you didn't have the passion for it, it would have been very easy to go to sleep and just yeah. kind of be in the background doing nothing. But there was a bit of a challenge to try and make the fabric of the scene tell a story, not just what was happening in the foreground. Peter's the master of shooting reaction shots. He right. loves shooting reaction shots. And so you always had to be alive and be on. And if you if you played your backstory like we did, mm-hmm. it was actually a very easy thing to do. <laughs> awesome. A lot of fun. I can imagine, yeah, cause you, yeah, yeah. Rather than just be stagnant in the background, you're actually you're constantly evolving and it helps, it helps yeah. yourselves as well. So that's great. What was your... Most fa- oh, sorry, I'm, I'm echoing in here because my son's drum kit's right next. <laughs> We're moving. Ha- That's why I'm sat on the floor. I will apologise. Um, we, we've had to strip all the carpets and we- get rid of the dining room table. So yeah, to everyone who's listening, you know, Jed can see me sat on the floor of my dining room. <laughs> I, I, I'm I'm sitting in space. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm gravitating. We gravitate here. We don't have gravity in New Zealand. Do you have gravity over there? Wow, amazing. I know. Yeah, it's fantastic, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Well, that goes back to the doctor thing you see. You sat floating in your TARDIS. <laughs> hey, that's right. <laughs> cool. What was your most favourite thing filming The Hobbit? Uh, the camaraderie. I have to say that for me, my favourite scene was shooting the barrels, uh, being in the river, because a lot of the stuff that we did was pretty hot and heavy work, and being in the water in a wetsuit was fantastic. Yeah. Um, it was also a lot of fun giving Martin Freeman a hard time about the fact that none of us had got out of the river <laughs> at any point. So he was floating in dwarf weeds. Um, so it was great. It was great to kind of give him a hard time on, on a daily basis because he was the prankster amongst the group. Right. He was the one that would. He was the one that was always making fun of people and, and keeping us jollied up. So it was nice to be able to get back at him. But yeah, for me, it's that being part of that group dynamic, being part of such a great group of people. I mean, we still we still see each other, you know, uh, on a weekly basis. Some of us, and mm-hmm. whenever I travel, I've got places to stay. Yeah. Um, um, it's been an amazing thing in terms of that friendship. You do a lot of films where you don't see people afterwards, and this is not one of those. You know, we see we see each other all the time, and it's always a great joy to catch up and tell those stories. And mm-hmm. I think that's why we like sharing them with other people. We had such a great time. It was, um, it was like, like I say, it was like thirteen school kids in big pants in the sand, but just playing with whatever toys we could get our hands on. So, Brilliant. I think if there's one single thing I could take away, it's um, just. That, that, that work ethic that we're on this great journey together is amazing oh fantastic that's really good to hear uh, <laughs> especially about Martin Freeman <laughs> yeah I know he's <laughs> he, he was very funny he came up with all sorts of games to keep us from going spare um, but he was also the one that would he, he got away with calling people on an awful lot of stuff right you couldn't well, really begrudge him because he did it in such a lovely and funny way <laughs> but, but you know there was a bit of a bite to the end of it too he's got a he's got a cerebral wit that's for sure <laughs> awesome uh, yeah he's a uh, I'd love to meet him one day he's, he's got yeah he's, he's, he's very funny that. man oh yeah are there any other funny stories then uh, before I go on to the questions from fans that you can sort of regale us like what you just sort of the, the pranks you pulled on each other or things like that or outtakes yeah, there, there's, there's a lot more pranking us? A lot more pranking on Lord of the Rings, I think, because a lot more stuff was shot on location. We only shot eight weeks of location on The Hobbit, and a lot right. of it was in the studio. It wasn't 
There was one day when we were all gearing up for an our regal armor to, to possibly bust out the gates and then Thorin mm-hmm. stops us because he decides he's not going to, where um, William Kircher had the special helmet with a hole in it to go over right. his axe and we kept hiding it in between takes and so he would be rushing around madly trying to find this helmet. We would just hide it. We, no one told him that we were doing it. We just decided yeah. we would. It may well have been Martin's idea. I don't know. Probably not. <laughs> but no, there wasn't really, there's not any one thing. It was just every day was fun. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like you say, a bunch of school kids, it just sounds like you just sort of had that <laughs> oh, sort of great. camaraderie mentality. Um and you say you don't get that one a lot of films. Uh, I spoke to a few people from the Constantine TV show, which is where I started this from, um, and they had that as well. There was that sort of camaraderie. But yeah. you see some of the big films and that, and, and you're right. Because it's a film, it's a piece of work. You, you enjoy yourselves, you have fun on the set and move on. And then yeah. you don't, you know, you, that's it then, you've moved on. But I think just <laughs> the whole aspect of The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings is just so much so that it is. It's, yeah, it's part of your life, and, and, and speaking yeah. to you now for the last half an hour so far, it's, that's all I've got is just how much of a part of your life that's going to yeah. stay now. Um, it, it all comes from the top, you know. Um, Richard Armitage is a true leader in terms of the, he would always ask how the group was. He would always try and find out how the morale was. Mm-hmm. He would make sure that his troops were happy and well fed, you know. Um, he was like, he was the heart and soul of that journey just in terms of if ever we were looking tired or whatever, we'd look to our leader, and he was never, uh, he was, I trained with Richard, he's, mentally the toughest guy I've ever trained with just in terms of how determined he was to be fit yeah. and to be the king and to be able to do whatever it took to get mm-hmm. to the end of his mission. And there were definitely times where he had to take himself apart because of Thorin's journey where he was separated from us mentally. Mm-hmm. But, you know, no no one actor ever came on set with an ego bigger than the project. Mm-hmm. And that is what defines these films is that the story is like that too. That's you know you're only as strong as your weakest player, and Tolkien writes like that. That even the weakest player can be the person who saves the day. Well, exactly. Um, which is and, like you said yeah. at the beginning. That's the whole point. You know, it's yeah, yeah. And so that's that that kind of the, the kind of mentality of the writing, or the ethos of the writing, but also the way that the filmmakers had kind of what they'd learnt on Lord of the Rings is that. You don't have to cast huge superstars to make a good film. You want to cast a group of people that gets what you're trying to do mm-hmm. and will follow you to the ends of the earth. And we, we would have done anything for our filmmaker. You know, literally, we would have done anything. <laughs> yeah. But we also would have done anything for each other. And I think that that's whenever there were tough days, we'd help each other along. You know, if someone was struggling, we'd say, Come on, man, just one more take. We can do it. Let's go. Yeah. There, there was one day on the Goblin Caves where most of the actors had been swapped out by their um, stunt doubles, and there was only myself and Martin, Graham, and Richard left of the actors. Mm-hmm. And at the end of it, we were almost fainting from the heat. And I said to Richard, oh, I was only doing it because you were still doing it. And he said, I was only because Graham was still doing it. And Graham said, well, none of us were going to quit as long as Martin was still doing it. <laughs> so we kind of we'd hung in there and hung tough because we didn't want to be the one to actually let the side down. Yeah. And I think that, that you know, if I had to take one day away from it and go, that's the day that... I went, oh, I get what this is about. We came off set very proud of the fact that we backed each other. Mm-hmm. No, yeah. That's, that's, that's really good. That is great. Um, and Graham, obviously, now in Outlander as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So he's, he's sort of similar. He's still medieval type roles. He's just playing Dwalin. He's going to play Dwalin in everything he does. Sorry, <laughs> Graham, but you know it's true. <laughs> Slightly angry man. Slightly yep. angry warrior type of person. <laughs> Yeah, he's changed his uh, changed his dwarf robes for a kilt this time. <laughs> Absolutely, he probably had a kilt on underneath his dwarf robes. To be honest. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. I don't want to know what was under that. <laughs> no, no, don't. I'd like to. Yeah, Graham's another guy I'd love to speak to as well one day. He's just uh, you, you, well, all of you guys, but uh, he's, <laughs> he's seen him in Outlander as well. It's just fantastic. Like you say, the warrior type. Uh, yeah, he's carry carry he's that a on. Great guy. He's a very gentle man, actually, underneath all of that, but I think he just plays angry really well. Yeah, he does, yeah. <laughs> whoa, whoa, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there he is, walking right into Thumpia. <laughs> cool. yeah. All right, we'll move on to some questions from the fans now, anyway. Um, yeah. First one is from Nia Pearson, who asks, did you read Tolkien's books first, and if so, what did you think of Peter Jackson's interpretations, which you've kind of answered within it, but... <laughs> Yeah, I did. I read um, I read The Hobbit at age seven and The Lord of the Rings about ten, I think. And mm-hmm. 
grew up on a big sheep farm, so we had 7,000 sheep and 500 cows and a whole lot of horses. And I was, you know, from reading the books, Middle Earth was right there on the farm. I was riding around Middle Earth for most of my childhood, <laughs> um, role-playing, mainly Aragorn, but various other people as well. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so, yeah, I, I have to admit that I was part of the radio play that they, we put together a radio play with some animatronics to try and sell the idea to the American studios. And, right. and I left doing that radio play thinking, good luck, but I don't think you've got a hope in hell of ever getting to shoot these films. <laughs> I just thought they were too complex and it was too yeah. big a deal. It was too big a thing. And not that I didn't think that Pete would do a good job. I just didn't imagine, it was very hard to imagine how they would make those sets, you mm -hmm. know, how they would actually, in, in a small place like New Zealand, create a world that was so vast. Um, I yeah. should have had faith. Obviously, they did a very good job of it. But yeah, I, I was one of those people going, it's a great idea, but I'm not sure it's possible. <laughs> um, having said that, you know, when I, as I say, when I saw some of that stuff cut together, the first 20 minutes that went to Cannes, mm -hmm. I realized that we were part of something that was going to be amazing, not just for our country, but for the fans as a whole. Yeah. yeah, obviously there are things that were left out, like Tom Bombadil. I think he's my favourite character from The Lord of the Rings that hasn't that you don't see. And for me, the the part that I miss the most is the scouring of the Shire. I would have liked to have seen that. But yeah. those are you know, those are small quibbles. I think that they managed to nail most of the characters. And I'd certainly, people reading the books now have got those characters from the film in their head when they're reading the books. So you can't oh, gotcha. you pass that. Gotcha. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. I've got to say, I mean, I read The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit when I was probably similar age to you uh, in those. And uh, when I reread them again, that is, you're right. You just can't get it out. You can't get Vigo out your head as Aragorn. And, yeah. You know. yeah. They got <laughs> yeah. the casting so right. It's one of those things that they do really well is they, they, they cast people who just inhabit those characters so well. It's, it's, it's hard to imagine anyone else playing them now. Yeah, indeed. Mm. <laughs> Cool. So the second one I've got is from Wes Jacobi, who asks, "How long did it get ready with all those? How long did it take to get ready with all the prosthetics and all your hair? Because um, obviously Nori yeah. has a lot of hair. Pro probably about three hours. I think probably an hour and an hour and a half for the for the prosthetics to go on, um, and then the beard edge probably forty five minutes. So yeah, probably probably two and three quarter hours to three hours. It, it came down from the first day." First day we did it, it took a long time, and then you know the makeup artist got much, much, much quicker at it. Yeah. I have to say, actually, if if we were to point out one group of people that really went above and beyond, uh, our makeup and wardrobe people were the most amazingly patient um, group of skilled artisans I've ever seen. Because it was a huge day every day, not just to put it on, but to take it off. You know what people forget is that they're there at the same time in the morning as we are, and that they yeah. leave a long time after we leave because they've got to clean all of the wigs, clean all of the beards put them back on the rack ready for the next day. So the, yeah. the remarkable thing about these films is it, is it is such a team effort, you know. But, yeah. So Shaku and Lord of the Rings, seven and a half hours. Jeez. Seven and a half hour job. So that's the longest one I've ever done on anything. Um, uh, but well worth it. Yeah, that's like my entire Nine day. day. <laughs> yeah, very, very, very long days. But, you know, still good fun. Brilliant. Uh, yeah, you won't have much time to film, to be honest, after you've got that on. Oh, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit of film. An hour in between. Just, yeah. <laughs> that might want to show up back to the trailer. <laughs> awesome. Cool. Okay, Sarah Masters asks, do you do any of your own stunts, which I kind of figure you do, because obviously being a horse rider and a horseman yourself. Yeah. I, I, there's a guy called Alan Henry who's been, he's doubled me since Lord of the Rings. He's doubled me in a lot of things. And he, mm -hmm. you know, he's, he's, very, he's very like me, he's very similar. Um, but he doesn't, he doesn't get to do a lot because I'm quite selfish. I like to do my own stunts. <laughs> There's obviously things we're not allowed to do. We're not allowed yeah. to be set fire to. Can't right. set fire to. Okay. Um, they don't let us do high falls. There's all sorts of things that you sort of go, I'd love to be able to do it, but mm -hmm. really, um, so that the actor doesn't get maimed or killed, um, <laughs> they let Stunty do it. But yeah, I, I like to do, especially the fight stuff, I like to do my own stunts. Yeah. I think that it, um, it. I think Pete generally likes his actors to have a crack at it because it informs you in a scene as to uh, if you come out the end of the scene, you've just done a big fight. You don't have to act being exhausted. Yeah. You don't have to act the excitement or the adrenaline. You actually, it's part of what you've been doing. And I know you don't have to do a cutaway to the close up. You can actually just film it and then push in close. So mm -hmm. all of the actors uh, who came on board for both the Lord of the Rings and for the Hobbit got very, very fit. They had a lot of skilled fight training um, because they, you know, we sort of on a bound to do our own stunts. Really, yeah. having said that, our stunt crew are the best in the world, and there's a reason why New Zealand stunties crop up on all sorts of things, from James Bond right down. 
guy Ben Cook who does all of Daniel Craig's stuff started off on Lord of the Rings. Um, right. Guy who doubles for Tom Hardy and everything that Tom Hardy does. A guy called Jacob Tamuri started on Lord of the Rings. So oh, that cool. kind of training ground of of being on something that big and and doing those iconic stunts has meant that our stunt crew have been able to travel the world, which has been great for them. Oh, but yeah, yeah we're very lucky. Very lucky that I. I've had Alan Wright from Lord of the Rings right through um, to the end of the Hobbit period. It's been fantastic. And he's doubling me on a TV show I'm doing All right, um, for MTV, actually. So All it's right. great when you have your guy that you can trust. <laughs> Would that happen to be Shannara Chronicles? Yeah, yeah. I haven't been able to talk about my character, which is uh, after fifth, the 5th of January, I'll be able to sort of talk about yeah. it a little bit. <laughs> They're trying to keep it under wraps, which is... Yeah, I was going to say, I won't press you on that one, though. <laughs> it's kind of cool, but it's also very frustrating. Because it's an exciting character, you know, it's good fun. Yeah. yeah. Well, maybe I'll get to talk to you about it again. I know I'm hoping to try. I'm, yeah. in, talks, I'm in talks with Manu about it, Manu Bennett. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm, he's yeah. a hard guy to press down. <laughs> he's uh, very but, busy. Um, he is. He's, 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 man, I was trying, uh, yeah, trying, to, he, trying to track him. He's everywhere. He's, he's all over the place. It's like, all right, yeah. trying to get he's our most. He's our most travelled Kiwi at the moment. <laughs> Wherever you are, Manu. Hey, bro. <laughs> Wherever, in the, <laughs> Wherever in the ether you are, be good to see you again sometime. Yeah, uh, he's got, I think he's on the way back from Germany somewhere at the moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, no, he's um, oh, yeah, I'm trying to track him down. Obviously, he's in Shannara as well. He's uh, promoting that. So yeah. be, I'm looking forward to seeing that myself when it comes out. That looks yeah, it's uh, going to be great. It's going to be great for the fans. Yeah, it definitely looks that kind of. Again, it's from another huge, you know, fan uh, yeah fantasy novels, just like the uh, yeah. Lord of the Rings. So yeah, it's uh, yeah. that be a good one to look out for. Okay, Emily from Twitter has asked, would you ever be interested in having a reunion with the other Hobbit actors and making a short Hobbit musical? <laughs> you know, we've talked about that so many times. We do, most of us get together at a thing called HobbitCon in yeah. Germany um, once a year. Um, great guy, Duke Bartholomew, who started RingCon, has been doing it. But really, I, I, we've, just had a big, um, we've just had a big round of uh, Christmas emails from each other, actually. What, what we call the right. fellowship, which is the 13 dwarves, uh-huh. Ian and, uh, and we sort of call ourselves a fellowship. That's the kind of hardcore that started together. And yeah. we do keep in touch um, with the idea that one day it would be great to have a, to, to come back and shoot the fourth film, the Ori Dori Nori story, um, <laughs> get everybody back on board. Obviously, Philly and Kelly and Thorin would be there as ghosts, a bit like in Star oh, Wars. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. be able to. But um, yeah, I. I Look, I, it would be fantastic to, to, to get together in, in one place and have a huge reunion. I think we'd all be up for it. It's just. One of the great things of having been in these films is what it's done for people's careers. It's yeah. been an amazing way of launching into that kind of international stratosphere of being asked to do projects in other countries and also projects in our own countries that have been shot from overseas. It's been There's nothing better than being in a film that upskills you in other people's eyes just in yeah. terms of you being a saleable commodity. It's a hard thing down here in New Zealand. A lot of the stuff that we do doesn't get seen at all. Um, by other people, so yeah. Sorry, that's all right. <laughs> Someone's barking at me. It's stuff that's happening out there. So yeah, I mean, trying to track everyone. Like I say, Graham's busy on Outlander. Um, Richards in Berlin shooting a TV series there. Manu's in Shannara. So yep. um, uh, Adam Brown's shooting stuff in the UK. Everyone's busy, which is which is a great thing. Um, obviously, Aiden is pole darking, pole darking for the rest of his <laughs> life. Um, great seeing him in that because Ross Poldart was one of my favourite characters from my right. youth growing up it's, it's nice to see our friends getting good jobs and, it, and we have to be honest if it wasn't for um, the exposure of The Hobbit you know, apart from Martin who was a mega star and Ian who were <laughs> mega stars before mm. a lot of us kind of it's been a great thing in terms of um, being a viable entity for um, outside, outside studios going oh well you're in The Hobbit so we'll look at you All right, it's, awesome. it's, 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 it's it's opened huge. It's opened doors for all of us. It's been great. Yeah, no, that's great, and uh, it's great to you know say to bring to us fans as well your acting prowess, and obviously everyone's you know we to, to, to come to us to see. Yeah, pat yourself on the back there. That's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, no, you know to, to sort of bring that, and it's it's great to see that you guys are also busy with it. Um, yeah, and. and, and Except for me as well. For you guys wanting the reunion, it's hard because you're all so busy. And me, because I'm trying to get hold of you. <laughs> I'd love yeah, to talk yeah. to you all in here. Look, um, <laughs> it, it may well be that the first, that when next time we meet, we'll be on Mars or on the moon or something like that. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I I think you know if um, if Pete ever stops stops long enough to to have a reunion, I think he'd he'd love to organise everyone coming back from both films actually. 
from all of the Middle Earth films coming back to New Zealand, those of us that are still around, and you know, it has been it's been a sad few years for you know, for you know losing some of our, mm. our Middle Earth Middle Earth um, stars. But I think it would be amazing for everyone to come back here and just spend a couple of weeks reminding ourselves of what an amazing journey it was because it really was. It's, we'll never do anything. It doesn't matter how big a project we do from now on. We'll never be in anything that touched us like these films did. It's, yeah. It comes from the work. It comes from the comes from the literature. It's such a well loved thing. It, you know, it's it'd be hard to muck it up because no one wanted to make a mess of it. So I think yeah. that I think that we've that's what's changed us as a group of people is that we know we've been part of something that'll never be done again. Oh yeah. Well, maybe. Who knows? <laughs> oh God, no! Please, no. <laughs> no, no, try, no. <laughs> they seem to try and remake everything reboot. now. Yeah, no, no reboots. No. They're, they're rebooting so much table. stuff. <laughs> exactly. They're rebooting so much now. You just you leave Lord of the Rings and Hobbit alone. Just leave yeah. them. <laughs> they're just perfect. I'm not a fan of the reboot. I'm a fan of new stories. Exactly. <laughs> I hear you. Story. That's a conversation I always have with my wife. It's like when I see another one coming out, it's like, oh, for God's sake, so there's, you know, give some originality. Puts, there's loads of stuff out there to, which can be done. There is. Um, like Shannara, yeah. for example, you know, that's been made. Look at look what else. Yeah. You know, what else is out there? It's absolutely yeah. fantastic. Cool. So, okay, moving on to the next one anyway. Anna XX, I think that's how you pronounce it. She's from Twitter as well. I was asked, whilst filming The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings, what was your worst injury, if any? I got a really bad rash on the inside of my thigh. <laughs> <laughs> In the scene where I'm kicking Aragorn on the wag, they had this really rough saddle that I was sitting on. It was right. sort of meant to be the, the back of the wag. Mm-hmm. And um, because I only had this kind of leather... G string and these chaps, which started halfway down my leg. Yeah, I ripped all the skin off the inside of my thigh. It was actually one of the funny things that happened too. The cameraman down there kind of went, Oh! <laughs> and I'd fallen out of my leather G string at some point, <laughs> and it was right mid camera. It was one of those things which you probably shouldn't talk about, but it definitely wasn't everybody's cup of tea. But it was just the way that he went, Oh, no, no, hand <laughs> off. So, yeah, that, oh. was, that was my worst injury. I've been very lucky actually. Um, didn't manage to fall off a horse on set. Um, even in the, apart from the headbutt, Vega, you know, I did see stars, so that was probably the worst injury injury. Right. So yeah. Um, apart from that, no, I was very lucky. Um, I, I can come away from it saying no, I I didn't actually get injured at all. Not like those other soft actors. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. I was going to say the rash could have been from a dwarf in there. Dwarf. Could it have been? Yeah. I was Could have been from something we we just won't talk about that. It could be a family yeah. show. Yeah, true. <laughs> are there such things as dwarf houses of ill repute on her in the Middle Earth? There definitely are. Pretty sure. Pretty sure oh, yeah. that Dory runs it. Actually, that's why he's so buttoned up. It's because he runs a. Yeah. <laughs> Dory the madam. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Oh, cool. He, he made me around. <laughs> cool. Okay, the next one's from Stephanie, who is at Stephanie ACL. What was your favourite role in your long career so far, besides Nori? Um, there's a great play I did called Skin Tight, which, we, which I toured for 10 years. Um, mm-hmm. A character called Tom, and he's probably the closest to me, given that it was a, it was a play about a couple living on a farm in South Canterbury. Mm-hmm. Took it to the Edinburgh Festival in 1998, won a fringe first with the play and got to play in London actually at the um, New End Theatre in Hampstead, which was great. Um, It was a character that, as I say, I toured on and off for 10 years and of all of the characters I've played anywhere, he's the one that I love the most just because I was able to speak with a farmer's voice. Having grown up on a farm, it was nice to actually play someone who wasn't that far away from me. Um, The play has been, been given a lot of awards for the poetry. Um, it's, a, it's a man who comes back from the war and he's been changed and he and his wife are sort of talking about what it was growing up, the passion of growing up on the land and what it meant to them mm-hmm. and it's a play about loss, she, she leaves early and he's kind of left and so it was, the, it was the character that actually progressed me as an actor more than any other part it's, if I could get the rights to turn it into a film I'd love to I would, I'd be too old to be in it now <laughs> but it, it just, it's such a beautiful piece of writing okay. it's a uh, the, the, the same playwright, um, I did a play of his with my eldest son last year called An Unseasonable Fall of Snow, and right. Bernard Hill and I are in the process of turning that into a feature film at the moment, so All right, cool. with any luck, the writer's work at least will we'll, we'll get seen, but yeah, yeah. But, yeah, that was, there's not really a film character I could say that actually has had that kind of impact on my career in the same way, 
Yeah. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so, what's the state? This is also from Stephanie. She had three. What's the status of Trails End? Is it in production yet, and will it be released in the US? Mark Hedlow and I just did a little thing for um, Larry Curtis. We sent him. Uh, we're doing our practice gunslinging. Well, we don't really know. Um, I know that they're looking at shooting it next year, but you know, one of the big problems is availability because Graham McTavish has been cast, myself and um, Mark Hadlow have been cast, mm -hmm. and it's really, I think, their biggest problem is going to be getting us all together at the same time in the same place. Yeah. Um, Trials in, guys, wherever you are, good luck with that. But um, <laughs> I'm, I'm free whenever, apart from these dates. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's a tricky one. Um, the second series of Shannara, of course, we don't know when that's going to kick off, so I'm not yeah. really sure of what my availability is going to be, but I think they're sort of looking at at the fall in America, so um, if, if that's where we're shooting, sort of like August, September, that's mm -hmm. the only dates I've been told. It's definitely right. going ahead. Um, they've got a full cast now, and it's just a matter of um, putting all the nuts and bolts together. But I'm ironing off my chaps, got my horse there, got my gun. <laughs> I'm learning to chew backy. The thing with chewing it is you don't eat it. I, it took me a while to realize that swallowing that stuff is not good for you. You mm. just got to chew and spit it out. I'm practicing all that stuff. I'm practicing growing a mustache. You can't practice that stuff, I know, but oh, no, I'm growing my own facial hair this time. Growing my hair long. I'm really looking forward to it because even growing up watching westerns, that's the genre that I really am most keen to be a part of. Awesome. I practice my entire life for that. Pew! You need to go to the You probably She'll probably know before I do. Yep, fair enough. Uh, the last one from Steph is, do you, do you ever consider to be stand-up comedy? Because she thinks you can have your own show. <laughs> I am some yeah. stand-up. I, I did. I am said some stand-up comedy here, and it was the most terrifying thing to watch. <laughs> great when it's going well, but when someone doesn't do well and they're getting booed off stage, that for me was a scary moment. I went, wow, I don't even want to do this. I have a huge admiration for people who do stand-up. Um, Martin Freeman and I had this conversation. He'd just been to see a friend of mine, Rhys Darby, here in New Zealand doing stand-up, and he just said, man, that guy's so brave. Martin's a really funny guy, but yeah. when you have character, you have a character to fall back on. You know, you've know, you got this character that you're playing, and you can kind of get it to save you. With stand-up, it's like you're naked on stage completely, and people can be laughing at you, and you're not sure why they're laughing. Yeah, And it's the thing of being able to reinvent stories in a way that are funny. Oh, I sort of... I think the closest we get is doing these conventions where you stand up and tell stories and people laugh. Um, in some ways now, if I was to do stand-up, I'd probably be less scared of it than I was back in the day. Uh -huh. But at the same time, that's as far as I want to take stand-up. <laughs> Even with the convention, you still have your mates. You can go, oh, I'm not being funny anymore. Talk to one of them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there's nowhere to hide doing stand-up. Um, I'd much rather watch it than do it. Having yeah. said that, you know, if I if I pinch together a whole lot of ideas, I might I might have a crack at it one day. You never know when I'm braver. <laughs> <laughs> I did hear something about it recently. I think it was a British comic, and I really can't remember his name, but he said something similar. He'd gone out his first ever act, and he went out there, and it was a pub, and they were expecting someone completely different. I think it was either a, a deep Scots pub or a deep Welsh pub, and obviously he come on. He was told, "Good luck, pal. Do whatever you want." And he said he just got out there. And all he heard was this big drunken accent from the back. Goes, well, yeah, <laughs> basically, like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. right, you know what? See so, ya. Yeah. He just turned around and walked. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It must be nerve wracking, like you say. You've, you know, you haven't got anyone to fall back on. You just, but yeah, you'd be good yeah. at it. You're good a storyteller. You, I'm sure you do fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just that thing of holding your nerve. Really, it's being able to hold your nerve and go, okay, well, these are these are funny stories. I'm, you know. But the, the great thing about conventions is it's a captive audience. They already know what you're going to talk about. It's a kind yeah. of a it's a secure realm that you're mm. that you're you're exposing yourself into, exposing yourself. But you are really exposing yourself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was, no, I was going to crack a joke about exposing yourself as well. <laughs> I'll, I'll keep away from that. <laughs> okay, Diana, who is at Rexy, is my co-pilot. Um, some cracking names on Twitter, aren't they? Uh, she's like, What's your fondest memory of working with Peter after all these years? Again, I think it's probably stuff we've kind of touched on, but... Yeah, my very first day on a film called Brain Dead, which was a zombie film, um, my recollection of getting cast was him coming backstage in a play that I was doing uh, that was written by the co-writer of Brain Dead, a guy called Stephen Sinclair. And my first day on set, just realising what a genius Peter was, because he had created this entire zombie world in a comedy way. 
It wasn't zombies like we'd seen before where people were meant to be terrified. This was really, really funny. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a scene set in a graveyard. There's a guy called Christian Rivers who now does a lot of second unit um, photography for Peter. And I had to be weeing on this grave and then this hand comes up and grabs me, pulls me down and then rips my stomach open. <laughs> and shooting in a cemetery at night um, in Wellington in the rain and just going, wow, this is, this is what the film industry is all about. This is it. We're actually shooting a film, a zombie movie. Um, yeah. It was quite a surreal moment, actually. But yeah, that's my, my fondest memories. My fondest memories with Peter are working on that. And then on the very first day of Lord of the Rings that I was there, just going, wow, Pete, you've, here you are. You've made it. This is <laughs> it. This is big time. Heavenly Creatures have done pretty well in terms of you know being nominated for an Oscar for writing, but nothing was as widely anticipated as this. Yeah. So I think those two moments are the ones that I remember the most. The very first time I worked with him and then working on Lord of the Rings and standing there going, he's really come of age. And, you know, he, he was up for it. There wasn't, mm-hmm. I didn't see a moment's panic. He was, you know, absolutely secure in the fact that he was going to do it. And that's the, that's the thing that sets him apart from other filmmakers, actually. He's always, he's always got a, a B and a C and a D plan. Yeah. But his A plan is usually the one that works. <laughs> awesome. He has been teasing about doing a, a Doctor Who episode as well. I've seen that. That would be amazing. <laughs> I think he will. You know, it's, um, I got to do the live show, actually. I, I talked my way into being a Cyberman. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> to do the live show that um, Peter Davidson did with the uh, Symphony Orchestra here. And I did it because I knew that Pete and Richard Taylor were both going to come to the show. And yeah, I managed yeah. to menace Peter. He didn't know it was me. He still, to this day, doesn't know that it was me in the Cyberman suit standing right in front of him. <laughs> but it was great. I mean, I, it's the only, it's, you know, apart from being the Doctor... <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. It was. It was. I'm a huge fan of Doctor Who. I grew up. Tom Baker was the Doctor that was on TV most here, and, and when yeah. my sisters were watching TV, it was the lovely Sylvester McCoy. Oh, so, yeah. uh, you know, I'm I'm a huge fan myself. So it was a big buzz to actually be part of that show and and see how nasty it was being in those Cybermen. So I mean, those people earn their money. It's really hot <laughs> and heavy work, but a lot of fun. Awesome, awesome. brilliant. Uh, Diana also asks, "What will you miss most about Middle Earth?" Like I say, the camaraderie, the, yep. not just yep. from the, not just from the cast, but also those crew, their, their crew that I've known for the last you know fourteen, fifteen, sixteen years, up to twenty years, most of them. Um, going to see it every day was like coming home. It really yep. was. It was like being part of a family. So, yeah, that that and the um, that and the free coffee. <laughs> you know, the, the coffee makers, the most outstanding people. They really they're the first people you see in the morning. Good cup of coffee. If it's not good, it's not great. So yeah. That, that, like I say, we see a lot of the cast. We still see a lot of the cast, and I do see a lot of the crew when I work on other stuff. But it's mm-hmm. that, that combination of working really hard on something that is a really loved story, working on great literature, working on huge, amazing sets that those guys built. Um, yeah. Yeah. Not having Alan Lee and John Howe around, they were, they were like an institution in Wellington. They, they'd been there for 14 years, and you'd see them yeah. scribbling away in various corners. And, you know, bumping into people like that, it's going to, I'm going to miss that. I do hope that I do hope that one day we come back and just shoot another film, just something yeah. to tie it off. I don't know why. Just <laughs> you know, that's my. I don't know where, if you're listening to this, Pete. If you ever watch these things, I think it, think you have to come back and do it, mate. No, nah, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. If only he would listen to this, that'd be great. <laughs> no, no, I know it'd be great. Well, you never know. Actually, yeah. when I'm tagging you in it, you might just think, oh, "Hang on a minute." <laughs> yeah, I might have a look at that. See yeah. what lies he's telling now. Yeah. <laughs> Cool. The last one uh, from Diana is, do you have a bucket list? And if so, is there anything you'd like to share with anyone? If not, it's fine. Yeah, um, I do actually have a bucket list. I'd love to go and spend a summer in Antarctica. That's one of the things I really like to do. There's 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 a group of places that I haven't gone and seen yet. And one of the great things about doing conventions is that it's a way that Kiwis get to see the rest of the world. But there are definitely places that don't have conventions. But, yeah, I'd love to... I'd love to do a horseback ride from the bottom bottom of the South Island right up to the top of the north and make a documentary about that. Um, as I say, I'd love to go to Antarctica. Yeah, there there is a bucket list of things I'd like to do, but it's mainly places I'd like to go to. Right. You know, it's um, New Zealand is a long way away from anywhere. We are at the bottom of the of the Southern Ocean, and uh, it's a long way to go to anywhere. So. I try when I do go to these conventions to have a week either side of it where I can go and see other places. But obviously, if I'm working, I don't get to do that. So yes, I do have a bucket list. But it's um, yeah, I, I I love the idea of being in a in a place where you get to actually meet the real people. 
you know, like you go to a small yeah. village in Italy and you get to stay with them and get to see what the people are really like. I don't really want that tourist being on a contact or anything like that. That doesn't appeal to me at all. I don't yeah. know that I want to be stuck on a cruise ship necessarily either, but mm. certainly the, the two poles, I'd like to go and spend some time there and, and uh, see the top and the bottom of the world. Yeah, yeah. it'll be pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's a few films I'd like to be in, obviously. A few, like one of the Avenger films or, you know, X-Men. <laughs> or anything like that, Mr. Singer, you know, just saying, I look good as one of those creepy characters. <laughs> plug away, plug away. <laughs> cool. The last question I got from Fran is from Amber, AMS 92096, another one. If you could have met any character in The Hobbit besides Nori, of course, who would you love to meet for real? Again, I think you kind of, I know from Tom what you Bombadil. Said. I just yeah. think the way that he's described as having been there before. Like, you know, he's obviously part of the magic of the making of Middle Earth when, when the when when the gods decided to make this place outside of where the Valor lived. Mm-hmm. He's obviously a part of that magic, he sprang up from something. He's never really fully explained and I think that's the reason why I like him so much, is he's the one that is the most iconic. Yeah. Um, a bit like Bjorn, in terms of you go, Wow, so where so where's he actually from? It's one of those mm-hmm. great things that Tolkien hasn't really put a firm even he seems confused about exactly what Pomba, Tom Bombadil is. Is he pure magic? Mm-hmm. He seems to be outside the realm of having any kind of worry about anything. He's, yeah, he's he's an iconic character. He's yeah, for me, he's the one. Let's let's just keep it simple. He's the one. <laughs> awesome. Absolutely. Yeah. Brilliant. All right. Well, thank you very much, Jed. That brings us to the end of the interview for the people. Um, if you just stay on for a second after I've said goodbye for the fat people, and that'd be great. So thank you very much, Jed Brophy. Um, hope everyone thank has enjoyed listening to that. Thank you. And I just want to say, great, great questions. Um, you know, you were saying at the beginning of the of the interview. I hope these aren't the same questions. They're always different, and and I'm always happy to answer them as fully or non fully as I can. And and if I haven't done a good enough job, then feel free to send me a a, a questionnaire on um, Facebook, my official <laughs> page. Thank you, guys. Awesome. Cheers, Jed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jed. That was absolutely fantastic. Well, listeners, that was something I hope you all enjoyed listening to. Certainly enjoyed being able to talk with Jed. And for those of you who sent questions in, thank you very much. Hope you got your answers you were looking for, or ones that made me surprised you even. And if you did miss a chance to ask a question, don't worry. Um, Jed has spoken to me, and if anyone would like to ask further questions and I can get some together, then he's more than happy to come and have another chat with me um, to answer questions from you guys. So thank you very much for listening. This is Chris Gordon signing out. Goodbye. <laughs>